Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for attending. Uh, thank you, Rasmus and Christian, for the previous presentation. They are really good. Um, I really like that Rasmus talked about purpose. And uh, yeah, I think there is no greater purpose than um, discussing about semicolon and uh, Angular 1. No, just, just kidding. Um, so yeah, I'm head of engineering at The Guardian. Uh, I hope you know The Guardian. Uh, it's one of the biggest publishers in Europe. Um, it uh, published a lot of uh, breaking news stories, like obviously the NSLX or Panama Papers. But it published as well a lot of, of articles to give a bit of a, a scale nature. Um, we are getting about 10 million unique users per day. We publish about 500 articles per day. And the uh, um, engineering team is about 100 developers. So. Um, First, uh, let me start with um, uh, a bit of history about The Guardian. So contrary to some uh, other uh, newspapers, uh, The Guardian is not owned by a billionaire. Um, there is no Jeff Bezos behind. Um, uh, it's a Scott Trust, which means that uh, The Guardian has to um, make sure it does not lose too much money, otherwise uh, its existence is in danger. And uh, in the... Um, 200, almost 200 years of its history, uh, The Guardian has faced recently a lot of challenge because obviously uh, digital disruption, uh, but more uh, significantly the way people consume and the way news is produced has changed dramatically, which means that we had to change a lot in the way we produce newspaper, in the way we produce journalism, and uh, how we can uh, delight our readers and how we can better inform them. So um, I'm going to go back in 2012, and uh, you have to imagine it's, it's now seven, uh, seven, years, of seven years ago, uh, but it's, it's a long time from a digital perspective. So you have a, a company, which is um, a newspaper company, so physical, physical paper, and um, they are looking at uh, their IT infrastructure, and they, they have heard a bit about the cloud. At this time, there is probably one or two Amazon services, the cloud is starting to be a thing. And they have a bunch of, of servers. And they're like, well, what should we do? Should we invest more in a physical hardware? What should we do? And at that time, people are like, yeah, uh, we can't be low on cloud. We should not be locked in. So we should definitely invest in new, in new hardware. And we're going to just provide the same um, load balancing and scalabilities and um, what Amazon is doing at that time. So the company decided to go that way. I said, well, we're going to use um, OpenStack, and we're going to have our cloud infrastructure, so VM, and developers will be able to uh, build a new product. Great. Uh, we hire a lot of very smart people, people that go from um, with an infrastructure background, and um, we build that team. We spent a lot of money. And two years after, it's a total disaster. After two years, um, some of the teams that have been starting using AWS managed to get um, ELB, managed to get load balancing, managed to scale. The people that are using the internal cloud are not. We are, giving, we are spending a lot of time and effort into building that cloud, but it doesn't work. It's, it's just not as reliable. And at that time, um, it's uh, 2014, 2012 is when we started um, OpenStack Road. We realized really that um, uh, it's not our core business model. The Guardian is not a technology company. Of course, it can, it can invest, but we have limited funds to invest in technology. And um, we understand at that time that we should go to the public cloud road. Uh, which is quite bold. Uh, it may not seem now really obvious. Like, yeah, you can use AWS or you can use Google Cloud. Or, but at that time, not a lot of companies start really to move to the public cloud route. There was a lot of talk about hybrid cloud, private cloud. But not, on, not only do we do that, we do a lot of um, other technical decisions, which are quite singular, but that match all context. And I will explain why they make sense and how they have helped us change our business models and probably save uh, The Guardian and liberal journalism in a way. Um, we understand at that time why we should move to, we should go moving to public cloud is because of economies of scale. And the best metaphor about it is to look at the history of aircraft manufacturing. 100 years ago, there was a lot of aircraft manufacturers. 
And in the recent years, you can see there is mostly two big aircraft manufacturers, Airbus and Boeing. There is a bit more now in China and Russia. But the reason why there has been such a, um, a, mark, a market consolidation is because of the unit cost you get. Your unit cost reduced when you um, produce more and more aircraft. And why is true around the uh, market of aircraft manufacturers? It's true for the cloud as well. It's close because um, the more Amazon, the more Google are able to uh, buy hardware and um, um, build new services, the more customers they get, the more the unit cost go down. And in this graph, you can see how the unit cost of a, of, um, of a server has gone down over the years and um, the growth of their uh, computation as well. So if you are using the cloud year on year, your cost is going to go down. And it's, it's fundamental if you are a company that have limited uh, funds available. Um, not only this, not only if you use, if you use the cloud providers, uh, you are going to benefit for cost reduction, but you are going to benefit in terms of opportunity from your tech stack. Um, in 2004, the first service, uh, uh, there was only one service in Amazon. And you can see that um, it's about 15 years. It has grown to so many things. And there is no way your internal team can build as much as capabilities on Amazon or Google Cloud or uh, Azure can do. And just to give an example, I think last quarter, Amazon released 487 new features for the AWS Cloud, just in a quarter. Um, not only we, we went, we go to the public cloud for our infrastructures, but we decided to go cloud native. What that means is that we mean we moved everything, all of our hardware, all of our application to the cloud. The reason we did that is the following incident. In 2015, after we decided, well, we should go to public cloud, we should do more. Um, uh, it was a heat wave in London. Uh, which is about 30, 35 degrees. <laughs> so not that, not that hot. But what happened at this time at The Guardian is that the aircon goes down. The aircon went down. And when the aircon went down, it means the internal server that were there were not able, able to cope with the actual um, um, temperature. So the CEO has to ask every employee of the company to leave the building and stop working because it was 35 degrees in London. Yes, amazing. We had to stop on our knowledge on our blog post. Sorry, we have to stop reporting. It's just too hot in London. And just because, well, you know, we have not moved to the cloud, we, are, we did not invest enough in the hardware. Uh, trust me, when you are a CTO and you report to the CEO and you have this kind of incident, you are not really confident or um, look very proud of yourself. So, um, not only we go to, um, to the public cloud, we go cloud native, we say we want everything to the cloud. We take a decision to go with a single provider, not multiple hosts. We did that for uh, three reasons. The first one is that it allows us to um, um, use the latest technology provided by your cloud solution. And you don't have to wait for um, uh, synch synchronization or abstraction from the multiple cloud providers. And I know that when, we have a when you are a developer, you're always like, well, but you are going to be locked in. It's better to wait for an abstraction. That's why you can't switch. In practice, you don't switch that much between your cloud provider. And the cost of, not, the cost of waiting for an abstraction to exist means you can't use a new technology and experiment with them. And the other advantage, as from an organization perspective, is that you don't have to invest across no knowledge across all of your cloud providers. You can just invest in one, whatever it is, and use that. The other reason um, is that it's really cost effective to use a single cloud provider. And obviously, you can see them as a strategy to lock you in. But there is this physical thing, which is all of their, all of their um, data centers are closed. And each time you go outside of a data center, you pay a tax. Not only you pay the latency to get your data out, but you pay as well a physical, a physical cost. Uh, to synchronize your data. So if you decide to um, have one piece of your infrastructures in AWS and another piece of your infrastructure in Google Cloud, it's going to be not cost effective at all, even if they are using different technology and potentially more performance in one and another. Um, the last reason, and I think it's often uh, something people don't realize, and it was really interesting to uh, 
uh, seen this presentation from Algolia, is about the reliability. Um, a lot of people think, well, you should not be hosting on a single cloud provider, because if you have an incident, then uh, if your cloud provider has an incident, uh, then you are fucked up, and you, you will, um, if you have multiple cloud providers, you will be more reliable. I want to give this counter-argument, which is the following. AWS never had an entire region done. It never happened in the history of AWS. Not only that, but it has never had an entire availability zone down. And not only that, AWS, in all the region it has, in all of the data center, it never had an entire data center done. Which means that if you build your application to be multi-AZ, you are probably fine. And if you want to have more reliability, go multi-region. But the probability for you to be done if you are multi-AZ is already really low. Um, so I've talked about this um, kind of cloud decisions that were quite um, radical at that time. I want to uh, discuss as well, uh, or move to more um, um, what has been called as, as microservices, but is more I describe as, as the distributed model that happen at the same time, and how it has helped us to drive um, more innovation and uh, help the garden to survive. Um, so what I call is a distributed model, and, and the way to think it is not to see your um, IT system as just one big application, but really think as a city, and every of your application uh, is a building, and you are going to build all the infrastructures and let every, every building evolve and just look at, at your um, urban plan, if you think of it. So, the, the thing, the, um, before we had, we had this change to a distributed model, you have kind of a unified model. So you have a group of developers that are responsible for different applications, but you have mostly this kind of monolith. And you are like, well, you know, we should just work all together. We should have this big application. We are going to release. We are going to do a lot of testing, and, and it's important. And, and we have to be all in agreement. And the opposite of, the, of, of this unified model is a distributed model, where you say, OK, I'm going to have different team. Every team, we have full um, empowerment, empowerment sorry, to um, use the text they would like. They are going to be able to release themselves and they are going to iterate on their problems. And we're not going to synchronize too much between, between every team. So with a, a lot of this um, um, liberty comes, of course, uh, some responsibility. And the side, side aspect of it is that they're responsible for their budget. You, give, you assign them a budget and say, well, deal with that. Um, and um, if you think of it as a technical choice, linked to this organization model change, is we break the monolith. So before we move to this uh, distributed model, the Guardian tech stack was mostly these two applications that were doing a lot of things, which were called R2Admin or R2Frontend. This is here, or Frontend, and um, mostly the Guardian website. But not only, this is the discussion you see, this is some of the ads you see, this is um, uh, uh, some of the journalistic tools, and the R2Admin is kind of your CMS, with CMS++. And we decided to say, well, we are going to break that monolith completely. And we are going to create um, so many different. Um, does that work? Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Um, we are going to create so many different teams, each responsible for different things. So, in a modern newspaper, you always have um, some tools for editorial, which are going to be um, your article tool, but not only, because when you, produce, when you publish 500 articles, there need to be tools to how you manage the publication. So, you have workflow tools. Uh, you have as well imaging tools. Um, you have your content API, which is why is your API, which is your API about all of the content you produce. And then you have all of these separate um, applications that do different things. Obviously, the main front end that you can um, see when you access um, an article, but you have as well to have your discussion app, which is where people discuss and comment about the article. But you have as well your data lake, where you get your data because you are going to add advertisers and they want to see data. And uh, you are going to have um, your support because a lot of you have still customers to serve which have subscription and you need to serve them. So we moved to this um, uh, monolith and um, along of, of moving to this uh, breaking the monolith into microservices, we take some technical decisions which are uh, quite of importance. Uh, the first things we say, we say, well, because every team is independent and there is no big uh, cross-collaboration between the team, 
you need to design for failure. Like an error in your discussion stack should not prevent the website to display article. Or if um, you have a problem with your leg, it should not prevent you to publish article. So all of your app, you design them for uh, have the potential to break. And each of them, even if there is a dependency, should embrace failure. And the best way to do this um, is to prefer communication uh, via messages. And you can see in a lot of uh, tech talk, people discuss about mesh architecture and how they have multiple API uh, talking to each other. Um, a key thing, I think, from making a really resilient distributed architecture is to not call all of your application. Instead, just rely on queues. So you put reliability on your queues pro pro um, provided by your clou cloud providers, and you only make your application communicate through messages. So if, if an application rely on uh, identity, they are just going to read messages from identity. Let's say, oh, a new user has been created, or a new comment has been posted. And rather than say, oh, I'm going to call this API, which means that if the identity system is done, identity system is done, I don't care. I'm just going to read the queue. And um, it's, a, it's a change of mindset in the way you handle your application, but it allows you as well to replay an event. So you have an issue with your application, you just uh, spin it back, and you just have to reread from the queue. You don't have to say, oh, what are the API calls that uh, I should have uh, been able to uh, uh, operate or redo? Um, another uh, uh, thing we come with in terms of scalability has been to make sure we design for horizontal scaling. So you avoid to stare a state at every point. You only care about um, not having a state and, sc and, and scaling vertically. And um, if you have a state to manage, which sometimes you have, if you have a discussion system, you have to have a backend. If you have an identity system, you have to have a backend. You make sure you design uh, around the constraint. What are your constraints? So there is a uh, CAP um, uh, theorem, and uh, you need to think about it because this is how uh, you are going to communicate to your stakeholders, what are the conditions you are going to fail, and what will be possible. Um, the last things we did when we moved from this unified model to the distributed model is to remove or ops team. We had an operation team that was only responsible for deploying the application and making sure the application remained, um, or the applications remained stable, looking at the graph, telling the developer what to do. We break that. We say, actually, software and infrastructures are linked. And this is at, at the time we, we looked at that, this is the beginning of the DevOps movement. And we say we are going to have teams where there are people that have more infrastructure skills and there are people that have less infrastructure skills are just going to mix them together and work together. And, um, and they are going to design together why it should be their um, infra um, needs. As well as doing this, we, uh, we say, well, now we have, di we have different teams. That different team is able to um, really, that every team is able to release independently. We are going to enforce or enforce, encourage continuous deployment. So in every team, we tell the team, well, you know, um, try to avoid av 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 having more than two stages, your code and your prod. If you have more stages, you probably don't need them. And the way to do that is to say, it's fine to break, but if you break, you should be able to recover quickly. In the past, we had five stages at The Guardian, which was QA, release, pre-production, production. We moved to code, prod, and in, a, in some of the teams, we say you probably don't need a code environment. Just test, on, just test on prod. Move all of the things you are doing on your code environments to monitoring on your prod environment. If you have an issue, detect it quickly, roll back. Obviously, it, is, it means that you need to have the ability to roll back in a way that is just not damaging to your users. But work on that rather than working on testing every changes on all of your stages. Um, the last thing, which is really interesting because it's, it's, um, it's the same advice that Christian gave around abstraction, is encourage copy-pasting. Encourage copy-pasting because you design, you design for resiliency. So it doesn't matter that you are not using the same library or you do things in a bit different way. Just copy-paste and encourage, um, encourage collaboration through so cross-stem knowledge sharing. So rather than having a big standard to say, well, every team you need to use um, that version of Java, 
say every team, oh, look, we tried TypeScript. It's really cool. Do you want to try it in your team? Oh, yes, cool. I'm going to do it. And so the things we do is to say best practices, have time to share best practices, have time to share the knowledge within your team, but don't enforce too, ma too many rules. If a team wants to, want to uh, um, experiment with Go, fine. If a team wants to move to Scala, fine. Don't matter. doesn't matter. Every team is independent. They can do whatever they like as long as they maintain the application and are responsible for it within their budget. Um, of course, there are things that are common, and that needs, you need to solve the common problems for one. So improve the developer experience so you don't reinvent the wheel all the time, like logging, how do I access my logs, or deployment. And um, I'm going to show some examples now of things we have built to solve these common problems and how it has helped the team um, uh, to um, deploy more frequently. Um, the first tool I'm going to talk about is a tool uh, which is open source. It's called Riffraff, and it is a deployment tool. So because we say, well, every team can deploy, we say to the team, we are going to provide you a deployment tool. Here is your deployment tool. You can um, you describe what is your kind of application. Well, let's say it's a AWS Lambda, it's a serverless, or it's an EC2 application, and you provide them a tool where they just can say, oh, here is my project, here is my build, deploy. If I want to roll back, well, simple, roll back, boom. And then you have, um, across all the organization, everyone can see what are things deployed, what are the things currently deployed. Everyone can do a deploy, and um, it's very easy, easily as well to, um, uh, uh, sorry, to configure continuous deployment. Here you can see an example of a mobile lab application just being deployed, and you can see um, um, an API, sorry, for mobile lab application, and you, you can see that what the tool is doing, basically scaling up your EC2 instances, um, putting the new instances, and then uh, tearing down the old instances. But because everyone is able to use that, that tool, and you provide this as an infrastructure, this means if you have a new team, and they want to say, well, I want to create a new application, Okay, simple, create your new application. You want to deploy it, you can reuse that tool. It's going to handle all the deployment steps for you, and it will be visible for everyone, and you have rollback for everyone. Um, uh, give some, I will want to give some numbers to illustrate what I see. Here is a screenshot of the app on the garden uh, repository. You can see the um, number of deploys um, per day and stuff like that. Before we moved to this distributed model, we were doing 25 deploys a year. Now we are doing 900 deploys per week. So 40K deploys across all four applications per year, which is far more uh, things. And does not we, we provide much more value. It's, it's, it's costless. Great. Um, and you can just say, well, I want my continuous deployment. So you just say, deploy when we get master. So a deployment is just a, a merge on GitHub. You merge, master, boom, is going to be deployed. Um, I talk about um, budgeting, and they say, we well, really give the team the budget. So how you do this? Well, we build a simple, a simple dashboard to each team. So every team can see how much um, budget they have for the year, how much they have already spent, and where they are on their day-to-day um, -day cost. And then you can see how you match your budget across the year. So for a, fisc for a, a fiscal year, you can say, well, I have one million 500k budget on AWS. You say my, um, let's say my apps team has a uh, 5k budget. They are responsible on how they match their budget. I don't care. Like they can use whatever instances or services on AWS. And then you can you can follow, and everything can look at who is not respecting their budget. So here, Data Tech has an issue with their with their budget. Um, I'm going to talk to them and say, well, you need to match your budget. What's going on? And then they are going to look at new technologies so they can reduce reduce their costs. Um, another frequent uh, issue is, uh, is handling credential. So um, if you have in a distributed model, you, uh, you end up with a lot of AWS um, credential and AWS account. And um, the best way to do it is to say, well, there is no permanent credential. Because if you leak a permanent credential, an attacker can use it and tear down your entire cloud is quite painful. So what we built is, is a simple um, or, um, Google Auth um, translator that you, you log in with your Google Auth, and then you just have the capability to get temporal credential for the AWS account you need. So let's say I'm going to work on front-end today. I'm going just to connect to this application, go on it. It's going to click front-end, boom, 
and I'm going to get credentials that are valid for, let's say, four hours, and then I can work on AWS with this credential for four hours. If I got an issue, my laptop is stolen, or I put my key on GitHub, or I put my key somewhere else, no issues, the key is already revocated. So this is the kind of tools and services, if you move to a distribution model that you want to build to enhance your uh, developer experience and making sure that developing is not painful because you are not all on the same app and all of these problems have to be solved again and again and again. Um, I've talked about some of the strategy and some of the technical choice we have done. I want to um, demonstrate the outcome it, it has. Um, the migration itself to public cloud and cloud native take only nine months. In nine months, we migrated 70 applications over 50 teams. It's not a lot, um, but it's quite, it's quite good. But more than that, because we migrated to the cloud, in four years, we have been able to reduce our cost, or operation cost, by more than 25%. And we did that while growing our um, audience by more than 70%. So our usage of the cost has grown by more than 30%, and yet our cost has been reduced. And we have um, deploying much more features and much more frequently. So if you, if you look at it from a top management perspective, your IT department is like, wow, quite cool. They are costing less money, they are doing more, and um, actu actually they can as well bring innovation, which is the next thing. Not only we are deploying more, but we have been able to launch new features, new stuff that are really helping um, digital journalism. Um, and I, will I will talk about that because I think it's really important to understand that you can transform your, and I think you probably know this as developers, but you can transform your company and you can help your company to transform. I'm not seeing as TS or they are developers, but really transform your business model. Um, the first things um, I want to talk about is uh, an application which is called The Grid. Again, it's open source. You can go on, on GitHub and check more detail. Um, the Grid is the image management system that we use at The Guardian. If you are a big publisher, you need to manage your images in a way which is um, uh, quite constrained. You have a lot of uh, image providers. You have to credit uh, correctly them. You have to pay for the image you use. And you get a lot of people that are going to edit them. So you need a solution to manage all of this image on, and, um, and collection. And um, if you go to the market, um, a license fee for uh, such an application is around a million, a million per year. So it's quite, it's quite a lot of money. And at that time, we look at it and say, well, it's quite a lot of money. It has a lot of features, but it's not tailored to the needs of, uh, of, of, of our newsroom. So we say, if we are not using the cloud, if we want to build such an application, it's quite complex. If you use the cloud and use a lot of existing technology, um, it's not that complex because you can rely on a lot of, of existing blocks. And we built that application in 2015 using AWS Lambda um, and um, um, Dynamo. And I think it takes seven months, seven months for the first release. And it has been on production since. Uh, editors, editors are delighted. And recently, the BBC announced that they are probably going to use that solution as a next solution to manage images because they can tailor them to their needs and, build and, um, and deploy themselves again. Um, more recently, you may have seen that uh, the images on the, on the Guardian um, uh, has changed on, on the social sharings. Uh, two or three years ago, we introduced a um, kind of small um, logo you see on the, on the image. When you share an article about the Guardian on Twitter or on, on, on Facebook, you see that where it comes from. And um, recently, uh, we had the feature which is to display the year uh, it, has been, it has been done. We have done this because editorial people have come and said, well, we noticed that people are reading articles and sharing old articles. And this is used to, um, uh, to do propaganda. People say, oh, um, news newspapers do not report on this. And, and then people are intoxicated about uh, those uh, things that happened in the past. It took us um, less than two days to be able to release that change. It has a huge impact on the newsroom and on our own editorial. Why it matters? Because it takes only two days because you are, you are using a capability of one of our image um, uh, programmable CDN called Fastly. So allows us to add an overlay and because you have control, we have full control on how you program this. It's not a big deal. So we make, in terms of Talking about purpose, we make a small change from a code perspective that 
drive a significant impact to the journalism, to the journalism and to our readers. This is the best kind of outcome um, you can see as a, when you are a developer. I want to talk about transforming your business model. Um, you may have seen on the Guardian, um, the Guardian newspapers this call, call out for subscription. And to do that, uh, when we started doing that, there was people in, in the organization th thinking about, well, we should go to a paywall, right? We're never going to be able to fund journalism in a, in a way that, that works. And um, instead of that, a digital team can say, well, we can, we can have a small team focused only on the problem of um, driving subscription. So their, their, their objective is to drive subscription and see how far it can go. So you, you put a single team responsible for connecting with all the API, like Stripe API, PayPal API, and iterating on the, what you see here, where is display, how it should be, how it should be displayed, and how you can help readers uh, contribute to the Guardian. This, this team works in, um, in, a, in an iterative manner, and uh, to give a good example of, of uh, the difference of working when you are, when you are in digital, um, obviously when you display something like this, there are going to be a lot of stakeholders in your organization that say, I know what needs to be written there to drive people giving money. I know how it will display. And if, if you listen to them, yes, you can make money, but you are ne never going to optimize. If you talk to developers, they are going to tell you, and you know that, just say, well, we need to iterate, we need to check. And that's what we did. And I can tell you that the, the use of the, of the yellow color here drives 25% more contribution. The use of the Visa logo just there drives 18% more contribution. That's the kind of things you can't, you can't guess when you have 10 million unique audience. That's the kind of things you need the development team to iterate on your product and change frequently and constantly optimize to make sure you drive and grow your, your, grow your revenue. So because we are able to um, um, drive a specific team, just focusing, just focusing on team, we have been able to change our, our business models. And having ability to drive reader revenue, ability to, having ability to reduce our cost, I allow the Guardian for the first time in 21 years to break even, which is means we don't lose money. And that's a significant goal because it means that um, we protect um, one of the journalists um, uh, uh, institution, um, which is, pr I think, really important from a democracy um, point of view as well. Thank you. I hope you uh, like my presentation.